Generally speaking, when it comes to mainstream interpretations of Islam, I think there are two ones we can point to. There's the liberal version that views all Muslims as behaving like modern secular liberal Muslims uh, who reigned over societies that were ethnically and religiously tolerant, uh, who were feminists, who were far more accepting of differences within society than Christian societies were. Whereas conservatives tend to have the opposite opinion where Christian societies were very tolerant and historically, all Muslims basically behaved like Wahhabists do in um, Saudi Arabia, where they just kill or forcibly convert their minority religious populations. The irony is, the more I read about it, the more I think the liberal view, as flawed as it is, is probably closer to the reality. Although the actual reasons for that and how it worked are, of course, very different. Now, if we take a step back and we go to very early Islam with the Rashidun Caliphate, the main opponents that it was up against were the Eastern Roman Empire and the Sassanid Empire. Now, when we talk about the Byzantine Empire, even though this is pre the Great Schism, there was a lot of religious diversity within it, largely because there was a tradition of Greek philosophy. There's also a lot of very strong regional cultures, Greek, Armenian, Syrian, Arab, Egyptian and a lot of different interpretations of Christianity developed, partially because a lot of doctrine just wasn't completely settled yet. So you had Copts, you had Neophysites, you had Monophysites, you had Iconoclasts, uh, you had Nestorians, you had all these different sub-denominations of Chalcedonian, or I guess non-Chalcedonian Christianity that existed within the Eastern Roman Empire, and the state was very aggressive in attempting to enforce religious uniformity. That being the state's particular interpretation of Chalcedonian Christianity headed by the patriarch who was directly subordinate to the emperor. And they would aggressively persecute these minorities, uh, charge them a bunch of extra taxes, harass them. Generally speaking, they were very poorly treated. Jews were also very poorly treated within the Byzantine Empire as well. The position of this, these religious minorities was very uncertain and very much in flux. So none of them really held much loyalty to the Byzantine state. None of them, though, were really strong enough to break off and go their own way. What wound up happening, though, is when the Rashidun Caliphate showed up, into areas that were majority Nestorian or majority Miaphysite or majority Coptic, uh, they said, look, if you surrender and pay the jizya, we'll largely leave you alone. You can have a lot of autonomy within your community. You'll have to debase yourself in certain ways, such as not rebuilding or repairing your religious institutions without our permission. But so long as you pay the, the special taxes, you have a specified, stable position within our society. And it will be in our financial and political interest to keep you there. So in a lot of cases, you had persecuted minorities who were like, okay, this sounds like a much better deal. Sure, we're going to be ruled by members of this, this heathen non-Christian faith. But so long as we pay our taxes and keep to ourselves, they aren't going to molest us too much. And so generally speaking, that's what happened in a lot of cases with the early Islamic conquests, is you had either Jewish communities or Christian minority groups who would just defect en masse and surrender to Islam in exchange for having to just pay the jizya. One of the advantages the early Islamic state had was there really wasn't much in the way of overhead. They hadn't developed a big bureaucracy yet, the soldiers were paid by loot, so you didn't really have to pay too many salaries. And as such, there wasn't really a need to extort a huge amount of tax revenue from the local population. Also keep in mind that the byzantine Sassanid War had just ended, so people were being taxed up to the hilt and in a very abusive fashion. So when the Arabs came in and said, pay us jizya, it was much lighter than the previous taxes they had been paying. So once again, they, there was no general loyalty to the Byzantine or Eastern Roman imperial state, so they were real, quite willing to jump over and side with their invaders. 
Now, when it comes to historical taxation, it's really very much all over the place. In some cases, the jizya was a lot of money. In some cases, it was only a token amount. In some cases, demihood was very strongly enforced. In other cases, they were very lax about it. But generally speaking, you don't see, and I know there's lots of exceptions to this, forced mass conversions or Islamic societies just wiping out their non-Muslim minorities. I mean, obviously you have Tamerlane and certain examples of that, but generally speaking, they were perfectly happy to keep them around because they have this minority group who is giving them tax revenue and they can largely just let them run themselves and it's a major cash cow. If anything, it's uh, there are cases where they were reluctant to allow people to convert because it would mean forgoing all this additional tax revenue. Because if you're like in an early Islamic society and 30% of the population is Muslim and 70% is uh, Demi, then the 30% is being subsidized by the remaining 70%. And if everyone becomes Muslim, you're not getting that financial benefit anymore. And aside for convert, from conversion, unless you're in a, a particularly bad place where your state is collapsing, um, why would you kill people who are paying you taxes? It doesn't really make a lot of sense. I'm not even talking about this from any sort of humanitarian or tolerance perspective. I'm just talking about this from, the cold heart, from a cold hard cash perspective. If you're a shepherd and you have a bunch of sheep, why would you kill a bunch of your sheep? Um and then not eat them when they're producing wool at regular intervals. It doesn't really make sense. It's an expression that I believe the Emperor Tiberius came up with, that the goal is to shear the sheep, not skin the sheep. The idea is to take enough that you are making a profit, but not enough so that the people can't, can't are prevented from making more money in the future. It should also be noted that, and once again this depended from society to society, but generally speaking, only adult males pay jizya. Um, disabled people, children, women, and the elderly, I think were either um, excluded from it or they were uh, paid for on behalf of the male of the family. And it was a graduated income tax or a progressive income tax, so it did matter a lot based on your family's social standing. Now... The other thing to keep in mind is that Muslims have to pay their own taxes that um, Demi don't have to pay. Specifically, Zakat, which is kind of a levy on, I believe it's on your net wealth. It's, it's kind of a wealth tax that's used either to fund the state or to fund charitable programs. And I think it depends, once again, from time to time. Sometimes Zakat was about the same as... Uh, the jizya, sometimes it was more, sometimes it was less. And the demi were also excluded from military service. And there's a long tradition, or, or depending on the society, there's a long tradition in a lot of societies, such as with the Mennonites in Russia, of minorities who don't want to serve in the national army paying extra taxes to make up from the fact. And I think overall, this is a pretty intelligent way of dealing with religious minorities. Ultimately, in a lot of these countries, they're now at what, like 90, 95, 100% Muslim, and they didn't necessarily go through kind of the same forced conversion that people might think they did. The general goal was to um, disadvantage them in a way that uh, advantaged the Muslim community. Uh, both financially and politically, while at the same time making things just unpleasant enough that over time people would gradually convert to Islam. I know in the case of Anatolia, something the Ottomans did was they just didn't let them appoint any more bishops, and over time bad religious education just led to a lot of the local population converting to Islam from Christianity. The Christian European experience, um, especially in kind of the post-Roman period, is very different. Now, part of this is because Europeans were mostly dealing with heretics, that is, other sects of Christianity, whereas Muslims were mostly dealing with religious minorities. I'm not too familiar with how brutal Sunnis and Shias got with each other, but I'd imagine in most cases they were probably a lot harder on each other than they were with um, religious minorities. 
as religious minorities weren't the same existential threat to the state, that Shias would be in a Sunni state or that Sunnis would be in a Shia state. If we look at what happened during the, Ref uh, the Reformation, though, in the aftermath, there was just continual mass outbreaks of religious violence. You had the Schmalkaldic War. You had the Thirty Years' War that completely devastated Germany. You had Catholics massacring Protestants and taking, confiscating their stuff. You had Protestants massacring uh, Catholics and taking their stuff. You had everybody killing Calvinists because nobody liked Calvinists. You had the French Wars of Religion. Basically, in most European countries where there was um, multiple Christian denominations, extremely brutal and bloody civil wars broke out. That it, The whole thing went on for almost a century or more in a lot of places. And if you look at kind of the main example of where, at least in the pre-modern era, you had a, a Christian power occupy a non-Christian one in the case of Spain, the for enforcement of religious uniformity uh, was accompanied by a lot of expulsions, a lot of basically forced conversion in all but name, a lot of wealth confiscations, and similar measures that you didn't always see in Islamic societies. Then again, the situation Spain was facing is somewhat different, as you had a very powerful state across the uh, Mediterranean, and there were fears that the Moors would act as a third column and assist in an invasion, kind of similar to how uh, the Christian minority groups had during the Arab-Byzantine Wars. It's also something to keep in mind that when we look at historical Islam, Wahhabism, which is generally... So, the story with Wahhabism is it's a particularly puritanical brand of Islam that comes out of Saudi Arabia. It has become, in many cases, the dominant brand of Islam in the world because Saudi Arabia pours immense amounts of money into sending imams and religious texts to Muslims throughout the world. So, in a lot of places, the only imam or the only mosque they have access to is a Saudi-backed one. And so there they generally will teach Wahhabism. And so the Islamic community has shifted a lot in that direction. But Wahhabs back in like the 19th and 18th century were despised by other Muslims. They thought they were basically degenerate uh, camel fuckers who were completely uncultured, had no understanding of the intricacies of Islamic uh, legal theory. And the Ottomans had a number of different skirmishes and wars with them at one point tasking Muhammad Ali of Egypt to invade. I think the Saudis went through like three or four different Saudi states because people hated them so much they would go in and destroy them. And the idea that you're going to ex just exterminate your non-Muslim minorities instead of tax them is like a Wahhabist um, or, the Talib or kind of a Taliban idea. Although with the Taliban, keep in mind, there aren't really religious minorities to speak of in Afghanistan, other than a couple Shia Hazars. But, yeah, no one liked the Wahhabists. Um, traditionally, they, their kind of ascension is, is mostly a 20 and 21st century thing. And the main example people uh, present of Islam killing religious minorities, aside from Tamerlane, of course, which I think can be largely uh, put at the feet of Tamerlane just being a psycho, a very successful general, but a horrendous human being, uh, is the late Ottoman Empire. And it's interesting to note that the main genocides the Ottoman Empire undertook mostly took place once nationalism became a thing and the state started to become more and more secular. Uh, once the concept of pan-Islamism became less important and Turkish ethnic and cultural identity started to become more and more important is really when you see the genocides. And it's only under the Young Turks that you see things just turned up to 11, and that's when a lot of the genocides happen. Obviously, you had the Bulgarian, and I think there was a Serbian genocide prior to that. But once the Young Turks took power, there was just genocides all over the place. Now, I'm not going to get into the ideology of the Young Turks, because I've looked at it in the past, and it's the most incoherent thing I've ever seen, ranging from proto-fascism to liberalism to pan-Islamism. But the point being, you had a much more modernist conception of nationalism and national identity that fueled a lot of the genocides later on.
that the Ottoman Empire was going to be broken up into its constituent parts based on ethnic self-determination, and it was no longer about loyalty to the Sultan Caliph. It was about the loyalty to the individual ethnocultural group. So it's important to keep in mind I'm talking about this and kind of I'm trying to be somewhat objective in my view of looking at this. I'm not trying to say Islam's right or Christianity's wrong. I'm just saying that's historically kind of been the approach of Islam to religious minorities. I do think in a lot of ways it is a more intelligent one than trying to wipe them out because it does encourage them to eventually convert to your religion while at the same time sparing the resources that a civil war or uprising might cause if you go too hard on them. People also tend to get comfortable, even if their position isn't the best, they like something that's predictable. Even if the jizya is relatively heavy and they aren't allowed to do a lot of things and they have to prostrate themselves, so long as they're largely left alone and not continually harassed or molested, a lot of people are going to be happy with that situation. And even if there is a bit of jealousy, it is in the interest of the Islamic State to have the, those minorities be relatively wealthy because then they can pay more taxes. So that's the video. I hope people found that interesting. Uh, just as I said, I've been reading The War of the Three Gods, which is about the final uh, Sassanid Byzantine War, as well as the rise of Islam, looking at the early caliphs and the expansion of Islam out of the peninsula basically from the emergence of Mohammed to the end of the Rashidun Caliphate. So I highly recommend the book. God bless everyone.